Hey there, it's Steve from Serious Keto, and this is the Not So Serious Keto video podcast. This one's going to be a little bit different this week. First off, I'm outside. It's morning. Just turned 8 a.m. Still a little crisp out here, about 55 degrees. Plan on doing some gardening today. You may have seen the picture that I posted of my garden looking bad. So we need to start whipping things into shape. Today I'm probably going to start with herbs, getting the little patio herb garden going there. The main difference though that you're going to see in this podcast is the lion's share of it is an interview slash co-hosting podcast with Dennis from Black Tie Kitchen. And I'll start that in just a second, but first a little bit of housekeeping. Starting with last week's Easter egg, right here. A lot of people guessed that it was Jeff Lebowski, aka The Dude, but no, this is the out of shape and apathetic Thor from Avengers, I think Endgame? Wasn't that the last one? Well, it's Thor. The other quick topic I want to cover, and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is I am continuing to see some really weird stuff on YouTube. Not just the decrease in views and subscribers and people telling me that they're not getting notifications or that they're finding out that they're unsubscribed to my channel. I am seeing comments disappear. People will post a comment, I will see it in notifications, I will click on it so that I can read it and reply to it, and it disappears. Comments are not showing up in my held for review bucket either. Normally I get a few of those a day that I need to go through and check and see were they false positives, were they just caught by YouTube because they had a, an external URL or something like that. But no, I'm not even getting to review comments. Things are just disappearing and and I don't know what's going on there are viewers of mine that have been viewers for a year two years since the beginning of this channel that used to post regularly and I don't see them anymore and maybe it's possible they got sick of me it just seems very very odd to me that comments are disappearing and when I talked to Dennis at Black Tie Kitchen he said he's seeing the exact same thing so I don't know what's going on. But if you find that your comments are being deleted or not appearing or something like that, I just want you to know I'm not, I'm not doing it. It's, it's YouTube and I don't know what's going on. So that let's kick in to the co-hosted part of the podcast with me and Dennis on a Zoom call. Oh, one thing about this call, periodically the audio goes ever so slightly out of sync. Try not to let it bother you. It was something to do with Zoom. I don't know if it was maybe because my son was using up a bunch of bandwidth playing Xbox while Dennis and I were recording it, but don't let it bother you. So here we are in the Zoom call and my very special guest and new found YouTube best friend, Dennis. Dennis, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, so I run the Black Tie Kitchen YouTube channel and I really dedicated to good food and entertaining videos. Steve and I uh, and I would, uh, I would agree that you've accomplished that. However, I am disappointed that you're not wearing a black tie, given that, you know, I decided to dress up tonight. I am in rare fashion, though, because I'm wearing purple. Anything outside of black or dark gray or a shirt and tie is, is like, this is not characteristic. I wanted to stand out from the background so I didn't look like a floating head. <laughs> well, again, mission accomplished. Now, remind me how we met, because it just, it seems like... We didn't know each other one day, and suddenly we're just besties. How did yeah, it happen? It was, I don't, I don't know. It was very weird. I remember thinking, "Hey, I need to reach out to Steve from Serious Keto," and I didn't feel like I had any clout or any ability to to reach out and be like, "Who are you?" And then for some reason, I think I put out, "Like, who would you like to see me collaborate with?" And you were one of the top ones. <laughs> so I was like, "All right, well, that gives me reason to reach out." And then it's, the rest is just history. And that was yeah. a month ago, maybe. Yeah, I think I think it was also one of my viewers that you know mentioned that maybe you had mentioned me on Instagram or something like that. That, that so, was my tactic. Yeah, so I got out and I you know said something complimentary, and next thing you know, we we have three Zoom, four Zoom calls, and decide that we're going to start podcasting. However, you know we we tried to record one Monday this week, and. I, I, it was a lot of fun, but it really came off more like two guys having a conversation rather than a, a structured podcast. And well, because basically that I think was what it was. <laughs> this is true. So maybe 
if if I can suggest what we do, first off, I, I suspect that this is going to be something that we want to do on a regular basis. So why don't we alternate each podcast, sort of who is the the leader, the master of ceremonies, the host, whatever you want to call it, Johnny Carson. Is that? Yeah. All right. How do you feel I'm about me being that guy today? Go for it. All right. I'm game for trying anything. So first off, what got you into cooking? I... I just grew up around the kitchen. I mean, it was always in my family. There was, I mean, the sofa always had that vinyl on it. So you couldn't really sit there. It wasn't uncomfortable. <laughs> or when you had people over for the holidays, was, everybody was just always in the kitchen. My grandmother was always cooking. I mean, be, my grandparents were immigrants. So it was one of those things where you didn't go out to eat because it was expensive. It's like, well, we can go out and spend $100 on dinner for a night. Or that $100 can last us for a week and a half of, of food. So I think it was just a fortunate series of events where them cooking all the time me just observing is just how i ended up in, in, in cooking and just enjoy it so much did they incorporate you into the cooking at a young age or was it just passive sort of you watching it was a lot of passive i don't necessarily remember cooking anything too crazy as a kid i remember helping things and you know, kind of in middle school and stuff growing up, but it was really just a lot of watching, but it was one of those where my grandmothers were, were the type where they could have never tried or made something. And he told them, which you could have said lobster bisque and go, I've never cooked lobster. They think about it. Okay. And they tried, it was the best lobster bisque you've ever had in your life and nothing could match up to it. Even to this day, they just had, I mean, it was just, you're talking 50 plus years of experience, <laughs> but yeah, it was very much just experience base from them and it was it was always interesting to me it's just they always had that knack anything anything you could do they, they could cook it do you recall the first thing that you made and was either embarrassed by or proud of as an adult or no or? and i'm going back to you know when when did you get any did you ever get any responsibility to make something and or you know did you just one day decide make something on your own and and what was it yeah <sighs> It was, I mean, the first thing was probably like pancakes or something ridiculous like that. Something very traditional, like, hey, let me make pancakes or my mom for Mother's Day or something. Um, but outside of that, probably in high school, just frying a piece of egg, or frying a piece of probably frying a piece of cheese and eggs or sausages. It was nothing crazy. I never really, I never really explored. I mean, I would make mac and cheese every so often, but it was a lot of, just a lot of passive observing, which is kind of weird that. I've gone down this journey because I, it's all kind of handcrafted, handmade, like really curious about how things are made and, and the science behind a lot of it. Um, so it, it, it's weird to have that curiosity from just being passive. I don't know how to explain it. It's very odd. Well, do you ever, or have you read the book, uh, cooking for geeks by Jeff Potter? No, I don't know how to read. Okay. I'll uh, I'll read it. I'll record an audio book of it for you. I, I've been told I've got a voice for it. <laughs> yeah, no, I've never read it. Um, is it is it very kind of? I'm assuming it's very scientist, sciencey, very um, logical. A little, it's a, a kind of all over the place, but not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. There are lots of interviews that he does with various uh, people in the culinary world, including a number of people from America's Test Kitchen, mm -hmm. but. There's a lot of names you'd recognize in it of people that uh, he interviewed. And then there's a lot of on science, the food science. He doesn't get like full out molecular gastronomy, but you know he dabbles uh, around the edges of it. But he talks about if you're going to cook, you should know why you want to cook, what type of cook you are. And I think he came up with five reasons. You know, the first is. Um, you know, you're a food scientist. You're you're you love the chemistry of it all, and the magic, and the creativity, and and what happens when you put these things together. You know, what affinities do certain ingredients have with one another? So there's the creative person, there's the the loving person, which sounds like you know your grandmother and the family that you came from. They they cook out of love. It's it's a it's an expression of their love for you. And they're willing to spend all day in the kitchen making cookies or tamales or, you know, whatever yeah. it may be. What do you be. want? I'll make it for you. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Then there's the competitive cook. And that tends to be people that wind up being like in barbecue, you know, the pit master sort of stuff. Gotta you win, you yeah. get really into it. 
cooking is about recognition. It is about um, winning, basically. When you make a dish, you want someone to tell you, this is the best I've ever had. Mm -hmm. Then there's the people that are into precision. And those people tend to to wind up being drawn to baking because, you know, if you're going to bake, you really, you should be using a scale and measuring things out in grams. And, you know, it's a very precise series of events. And then the last is your cook for health. You know, you're, you're a diabetic or, you know, you've got certain allergies. So you're cooking and learning how to cook to work around certain ingredients. So it's good to know which one you are. That way, you know, where to focus your attention because if you if you are sort of a precise person and you start doing <coughs> i don't know cooking for love or something like that then then you're not going to be happy where do where do you fall on that spectrum of those different genres uh, i'm kind of all over the place um it's, yeah it's one of those where i think if if i were to rate them the number one would be i love the magic of cooking, I love the, the chemistry and finding how how ingredients play with one another. To me, that's mm-hmm. that's the biggest one. I think that dates back to the like the very first thing that I made, which was just mixing peanut butter and honey in a bowl and putting it on some toast. You know, you could put peanut butter on some toast and then honey on some toast. That's eh, fine, but when you mix peanut butter and honey in a bowl and then put it on toast already mixed, boosh. You know, whole different ball game. So I think that's so. There you go. That's my first cooking experience. But also, then I think where I got drawn into the the chemistry of it all. But then you know, I think there's a bit of it that's competitive. I mean, I love it when I cook for somebody and they say, "Wow, this is just amazing." And then there's the cooking for love thing. And then you know, with the background that I have in continuous improvement and operational excellence, I do like the precision of baking. I like I, I like the concept of it more than the actual doing, though. I seem to be, especially since going keto, not all that good at keto baking. Mm-hmm. Well, it's such a weird thing, just low carbon keto baking, because there's no ground rules. Nobody knows anything about it. I mean, that's why we don't have like the holy grail of of flour or flour replacement. If anybody's so, can you substitute this for that? Can you get that for this? There's no, there's no rules. And I think that's part of the exciting part about it. That pretty much anything you make. I mean, look at, just look at the, the variability in chaffles. You got cheese, oh, yeah. chaffles, pork rind, chaffles, this, ch- it, it, all for a waffle. <laughs> it's <laughs> really the exact same thing. There's a million ways to do it. Well, and that's one of the things I love about chaffles is it is, I refer to it sort of as the mini bake oven or easy bake oven. So, mm-hmm. but for grownups, you know, you got this ten dollar dash mini, and That's you can throw anything light. in it, and uh, you know, if you make a mistake, no big, you throw, throw it away. away. It's not yeah. it, you didn't spend a whole bunch on ingredients. That's that's oh. the one thing that sucks about this is, which I know you're very familiar with, is as you're trying things and it sucks having to throw it away, and if. If it's inevitable and you have to throw it away, because just eating something that sucks is different from having to throw something away. But it's just the waste of ingredients. You're like, man, like it just it's missing that one key thing. You're like, well, I got to eat it. You're like, who am I going to give it to? And and that's one of the things I I am really opposed to throwing away food. It has to be really bad, really, really bad for me to toss it out. Otherwise, I'll just I'll figure out something. I'll melt a bunch of cheese on it and, you know, throw an egg on it and, you know, some chorizo or something that can fix almost anything most things yeah but yeah unless unless it's chocolate if it's fudge then maybe not so much yeah that gets a weird consistency the pasta i made i i threw a lot of those away i mean there it seemed like the color of the rainbow and i tried to eat those and no matter how much cheese you put on there and then it was like a waste of cheese and pasta (laughs) there was no way around it i was like oh this sucks but yeah that really food sucks that's one of the things, frankly, that, that slows me down more than anything on recipes is, you know, when you've made four dozen cookies and you're like, well, okay, I'm not going to do another batch until I've finished these cookies. And I, I'm not, I can't eat a dozen cookies in a day. So now I got to wait a month before I can do another batch of cookies. 
uh, pancakes. Well, at least pancakes. I, I froze a bunch of those. And, mm-hmm. you know, it's sort of the, the lottery. I put them all in one bag, so I don't know as I take any of them out if it was going to be one for the good <laughs> batch or the bad batch. I think I remember this color. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, cookies. Oh, I'm still eating cookies from when I tried to do a batch two weeks ago. And it's, yeah, it's 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 one of those, they're edible, but they're not great. And then you, you look at the macros and it ends up being like 500 calories a cookie. Like, oh, no wonder I feel like crap. This is... <laughs> This is I'm literally just consuming something because I have to get rid of it. And you can't give it to a dog because it's got chocolate or lupin flour or something like that. So it's nobody else wants it, especially now in, in like lockdown type stuff. Like I can't go to work and put it in the middle of the, the, the lunch and be like, hey, guys, here's some gluten free or whatever cookies have at it. It's all right. Here's one cookie, yeah. <laughs> two cookies, 3000 calories later. Like, uh, that's those are the good old days back when you could just take any kitchen failure and put it in the break room and you knew someone was going to eat it yeah even if it was bad but this is like so these cookies don't taste good you had talked about the holy grail and you recently came out with pizza crust 2.0 yes and was that the holy grail it's a step towards the holy grail i think if you're watching the last crusade we are on the blimp <laughs> like we got the ticket the guy's coming around asking for tickets and then harrison ford knocked the guy out and dressed up in his tuxedo i think that's that's kind of where we're at um that's that was also not a great uh blue screen or green screen there when uh the nazis down and all the luggage shaking his fist yeah. up or, uh, <laughs> well that was a weird accent shaking his fist up at the uh, at the blimp that uh that was really a poor, poor blue screen. It's still a good movie, though. Yeah, it is. It is. Um, so, now that you've done 2.0, which in my opinion is the best keto pizza crust that I've tasted. And, you know, I hate to put that qualifier on it. You know, the best keto crust. Until now. But, you know, it, it's it's a reality. When you're not working with real flour especially something like a, an Antimo Caputo a double aught, which is just great for a pizza crust, you're not going to get that same combination of crisp and that gluten chew. So, anyway, I just I had to get that off my chest there. It seemed like a pizza expert sort of thing to say. I love the crust. At what point do you decide you return to it and work on Pizza Crust 3.0? How quickly or how long do you stay satisfied with the recipe before you feel it's time to start working it some more? Well, I think it was about eight months from the previous one. So I think it's when it was once once the urge really starts hitting and I've done enough other stuff. I, I think I need to have some I need to have learned something materially significant of some ingredient or some method or something i go ha huh, i wonder if this could apply to to the pizza because that was the thing is i learned about cognac powder and, and gelatin and the different types of gums and the different flours like lupin flour which was to me non-existent when i did the first recipe i was like okay let me try this and then you start experimenting and you go okay there might be something here and then you just go down that rabbit hole of 30 40 attempts later of <laughs> measuring things out by the gram or or even just getting one of the things too is is people trying things and getting feedback. That's been massive to me. If somebody's saying like, "Hey, I, I thought it tasted too much like yeast," and you try it again, like, "Yeah, it did taste too much like yeast," which is why this recipe was double the first. Um, or even just lupin flour, I didn't know about it until somebody told me about it. So I think that's one of those those fantastic things of the community of people trying things and getting back to you, because we're only one person. You know, we don't have mm-hmm. a team of scientists, a team of, of creators and stuff. So we can only do so much, but then there's always a thousand different variations with people just go out there and try like, hey, I think this is working a pan uh, as a pan pizza. Like, I don't know, try it. We can try this, do this, do that. And then they try to go, it turned out well or it didn't turn out well. And um, yeah, it's just, it's a matter of iterating on things and trying to come up with that that solution as, as a community. Yeah, I tend to think lots of times in terms of my old career and you know statistical analytics and design of experiment and things like that. Mm-hmm. And you think about doing like a full factorial design of experiment, you know, it's with even three variables. Oh, it's insane. And, and then you got to do, you know, you have to repeat a recipe just to make sure you got it right. It's the number of iterations are insane. And I, I suppose fortunately with pizza, 
that's a good thing. I'm I'm willing to iterate a bunch on pizza. Yeah, and that's the thing too is it's with low carb cooking. It's not like a basic pizza. Where it's okay. So you have flour, water, yeast, cheese, and sauce. Like it's pretty much it. Like you have like I mean, I think there's five ingredients in the dough alone. It's uh, lupin flour, wheat gluten, almond flour, gelatin. Um, and I, I think something else, I remember, but yeah, just a weird combination of things to try and mimic the real thing. 